PowerPoint introductory uh, presentation I can do for Chapter 8, but I would love to hear questions you have first, or either 7, 8, or anything else that you might want to ask about. finally into conservation issues where we're actually trying to serve Here, it is to get their information, in particular conservation genomics or genomics information, to uh, elucidate and inform the policy and management people. And that's what we see a really severe disconnect in North America. Uh, I think all the conservation biologists would say that, a severe disconnect between the professional conservation biologists, normally government employees, and those scientists who are intimately uh, associated with whatever species or whatever else have a lot of data and they can't get together. And they have, they have uh, different pressures on them. So publications and evaluations where these guys have to many times interact with the public and make sure the public is getting access to lands for hunting, fishing, camping, whatever else. And so these kinds of conservation issues and these kinds of academic issues often just do not jive with, do not interdigitate. So that was their point. But my point is, look at this and realize that when you see someone say, look, the major problem here is we need to stop the intergressive hybridization, number one, that's wrongheaded if, it's popul if 
just from the out go, from the uh, go if we haven't asked questions about fitness of the hybrids and things like that, but then also, I mean, how is that going to get into here except to just extirpate the hybrids, which is, doesn't really help us conserve in a lot of ways. So that was what I was trying to say. Good question, though. Other questions about intergressive hybridization? Once again, it's really we're focusing on eukaryotes. Um, which is also a wrong-headed approach because soil microbes are so important for so many things. We should be worried about conserving those and that metabiome as well, right? But we don't tend to think about that at all. Okay, questions? Anything else on this particular topic? Okay. Well, if you think of other things on that particular topic, just talk. <laughs> Raise your hand. So we'll, let me go ahead and give an introduction for Chapter 8. Now, what I'm not going to do is talk about our ecology, our associated organisms. We did that already. Remember, I used that as the exemplar those organisms that we associate with our ecological setting. I use that for the web of life, okay, that general talk, but I, I focused it on cats and dogs and things like that, okay, and food sources. So what I'm going to focus on here actually is asking the question about our own evolution, and we've talked some about this already, okay, so some of this will be a repeat. Remember, repetition is good. That's, I do it on purpose. So evolution of our genus and what we should have known or what we should have accepted all along, I guess is how I would put it. Um, and that is that we are reticulate. Obviously, that's going to be the take-home message here. But what we're really talking about here using this book cover Origins, not the ecology, ecological setting, but the origins, okay? Origins of humans. And what was Darwin's analogy that he used in Origin of Species for natural selection? What was his analogy that he used to compare and say this is the way natural selection will work? Yeah. Artificial selection, plant and animal domestication, okay, but artificial selection, experimental selection. So I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a, let me turn my phone off first. I am going to use an analogy. So when I wrote the book that I just showed the cover of, when I wrote this, one of the things I did was I asked the question, and when I wrote some reviews on primate evolutionary processes and our own evolution, what I did was I said, okay, if primates as a whole do not show intergressive hybridization, then it's unlikely we would have because we're a primate. And then I said, but if the flip side of that is that if primates are good examples of reticulate evolution, then why wouldn't we be? Okay? So the analogy I start with then are other primates. And what I'm going to do is show you a series of, we're going to walk, if you will, from more unrelated primates to our genus all the way up to our genus. And we're going to ask the question about primate reticulate evolution. Okay, inferences from analogy. So New World monkeys, there's various kinds. We can look at howler monkeys and spider monkeys, for example. Okay, these little guys scare the poop out of me, literally, when uh, I'm hanging in a, I've had, this, I've had this happen to me so many times in Central America and South America. I'll be on 
doing field work down there and I'll be hanging in a hammock with my mosquito netting over me and they'll come over and when they sound off it's it's amazingly loud if they're in the trees right over you and I have literally fallen out of my hammock tangled up in my mosquito netting they must get a real kick out of it watching this guy flail around on the ground but those are they're great little animals so here we have a relatively old analysis, and I'll show you some more new in a moment, but where we have Alawata, which is which are the howlers, okay, and then we have various kinds of different uh, New World monkeys, the howlers, the woolies, the mirakees, and spiders, okay, in terms of their common names. And if you look against across this, you'll no notice the discordance. Okay, the alternate placement of the same taxa using different sequences. Once again, remember, this could be incomplete lineage sorting. It could be due to intergressive hybridization, or it could do, be due to, more likely, due to both. Okay? And so, if you look then at just howler monkeys, within howler monkeys, the howler monkey phylogenies, are also, the various groups have also been found for decades to be, when they look at genetic markers, they look at um, various regions. Now they have RADSeq, all sorts of different kinds of many genomic regions. They find that the different forms, different species, different subspecies, do not show concordant patterns, okay? They show paraphyletic and polyphyletic patterns. And what they also know, have noticed, is they have mixed troops. And this, I want to use this as an example of the fact that, whoops, don't want to go there yet. So, historically, there has been very little genomic and genetic information on New World monkeys. Okay? Very little. This is all based on the mitochondrial DNA. So it's a fairly old data set. And there's various reasons for, there's various reasons. Most of the data coming out of these New World monkeys have been morphological and behavioral. It's just the way people studied them. They knew they had mixed troops, two different species that were moving together, okay, in groups. And they inferred, based on morphology, something like 3% hybridization, i.e. very distinctive quasi-intermediate forms. So very low frequencies of hybridization. And in fact, New World monkeys were used as, and I, I talked about them, as a kind of primate that broke the rule, just not a lot of hybridization. But I also recognized and wrote, but we really only have morphological characters, and those are not good for testing. Very recently, people have started doing uh, surveys using multiple nuclear genes. The same troops mixed, because these areas are fairly stable in Central America, Mexico, and South America, the same areas that had been diagnosed as having, say, 3%, are orders of magnitude, there are orders of magnitude greater amounts of hybrids, 30%. Okay? And that is because, once again, the quantitative traits uh, misled them. So the, the New World monkeys are no different, apparently, than the Old World forms of primates. But anyway, I get ahead of myself. So howler monkey phylogenies. So lemurs are a rich group, obviously, on Madagascar. And these are, once again, relatively old data. I think they're like from 2004, based on very few loci. So if you phylogenetic inference for relationships within the lemur genus Ulemur, note the distribution of taxa belonging to Ulemur fulvus. So these are basically different subspecies of fulvus. But also different species show these kinds of discordances. And what we know from other people's data is that there are, these are, this is across a hybrid zone, a current hybrid zone, and there are many of these ecotonal hybrid zones 
on Madagascar, where you have different forms, two different species in this case, that are incurring and coming up and overlapping. And these are structure analyses, just not with pretty colors. And so this is the uh, proportion of the pieces of genome from either here or that species, OK? In this ecotonal or hybrid zone, yes? Uh, there can be other species. Actually, finches hybridize like crazy. I can't say every species, but the finches that I, that I know of in Australia, for example, one of the PhD students was working on zebra and a number of other species. Birds are great examples of reticulate evolution. Just across the board, they're really good. But I don't know that ever, I would guess that not every species is contemporaneously hybridizing. No. Uh, all of them. I would venture to hypothesize, and once we get the genomes, we'll know all of them went through divergence with genetic exchange. I, I, that would be my hypothesis, my working hypothesis. And hopefully, there would be exceptions to that. Maybe 90% of them went through divergence with genetic exchange, and the others were completely allopatric. But yeah, so using, using primates, the point is, what I find with, with generally is that what we think, what people's perception as evolutionary biologists has been in the past is the more complicated, quote unquote, or more complex an organism is, an animal is in particular, the less likely they are to, quote unquote, make a mistake and intergressively hybridize. And so then they would point to primates. Does that make sense? And so what I wanted to do was deconstruct that argument and say, is it true? Is that accurate? And the overall answer is no. Primates are really good examples. They're like canids. Um, but you are exactly right. The analogy is just that, right? The analogy is, do we see reticulate evolution in, across primates? But it doesn't mean that humans had to be intergressively hybridizing, even if we do, or if we did, that lemurs had to. But yeah, that's a good question. OK. So this just indicates, this is more recent paper than what I showed you, the kinds of patterns that they've seen across Madagascar uh, in overlap areas and why they would potentially see the kinds of discordances uh, that they have in their phylogenies for, for lemurs in general. Once again, I would mention one thing. OK, this is the mitochondrial DNA of one species, and this is of the other. And hopefully what you can see is that the intergression is largely in one, degree, one direction in general. But it is a mosaic. OK. Uh, moving closer to us, now we're still in old world forms like the lemurs, but baboons, and I've shown you this one before. So there are numerous contemporaneous hybrid zones that are being studied by various folks who are interested in behavioral ecology. What do the hybrids do in terms of do, they, do males collect harems like they do uh, if they're non-hybrids? How do they interact with other baboons, all those sorts of studies, as well as phylogenetic systematics and looking at the evolution of these hybrid zones. And I also showed you this one. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it. Whoops. So remember the Rungwasebus that I uh, published this paper with. We actually have published some other papers, too. But anyway, the Rungwasebus that anomalously fell within this clade of baboons that it overlaps with geographically. And since then, other people, not us, other people have, have explored other samples of Rungwasebus and confirmed that that was most likely intergressive hybridization. So that's baboons and baboon-like things, OK? And now, what about gorillas? Remember, we're, this is analogy. So what about gorilla information? OK?
so these are, once again, 12-year-old data. And the reason I show these is to indicate that these guys, Clifford et al., stumbled upon, found something that was indicative of reticulate evolution. They really used it to argue that it could be reticulate evolution. It could also be in complete lineage sorting. There are two species reflected here the eastern form and the western form. And hopefully, hopefully you can see the eastern form is not together. Okay? So it's paraphyletic and or polyphyletic. And so these data would suggest with, with a limited amount of sequences, sequence information from mitochondrial DNA, if I remember correctly, that these guys may have had intergressive hybridization at some point in time. They're currently disjunct, by the way just so you know, because of habitat destruction by us in Africa. More recently, last year, McManus et al., using whole genome sequencing, uh, looked at eastern, western, and uh, cross-river gorillas. These are in the same species, but they're different subspecies of western gorilla. Okay? These are the various models that they Try, that they tested, and this is the one that their data suggested was uh, the most robust. So definitely with intergression, but also two, they call it migration in this paper, but with two events, a minimum of two events, one from the western into eastern, and one from the river, uh, cross river form, another subspecies into the eastern. Okay, but they tested a number of different kinds of intergression, intergressive hybridization. Once again, hopefully you can see that there's an asymmetry in the intergression. I'm just emphasizing that because I've been, I think I've mentioned this to you, I've been asked to write a review on why do we always see this in plants and animals, and I still have no clue why. Okay, if you figure it out, if you figure something out, or you determine why this would be the case, write it up so I can cite it. Okay, so what they detected with Eastern and Western in that data uh, is indeed at least partially due to intergressive hybridization, ancient, but intergressive hybridization. Okay, so gorillas, chimpanzees, okay, so we're walking, we're now in the clade, right, of our most common, sorry, most related contemporaneous species to us, to our genus. And I would add, I would argue that we all ought to be in the same genus. I've already said that. Chimps, gorillas, bonobos, and us, taxonomically, based on genomic differentiation and a number of other things, we should be in the same genus. Definitely in the same family. So, that's my two cents worth. Nobody's asking me, by the way, but um, I think that makes more sense. So reticulate evolution in chimpanzees. So once again, 1999. So these are the common chimps, and these are bonobos. So this is pan paniscus and various kinds of pan troglodytes. Okay? And what you can see here are there a bunch of letters down here, okay? W's, C's, E's, and those are various forms, sometimes called subspecies, some sometimes called different species, depending on who you read, but differentiated forms of the common chimp. And also, there are actually forms of the common chimp, so they're interdigitated, W's, E's, and C's, Central, West, and East, I should have said that, are interdigitated with one another in these data. Okay? And once again, 1999, this is, these are mitochondrial DNA data. These are very recently diverged. So once again, we would expect incomplete lineage sorting as well as possibly integration to have contributed to this picture with whole genomes. These are the kinds of pictures that we get. Hay 2010 sort of summarized what the best model for, for chimpanzee intergressive hybridization currently is. 
and that is that no, although this is not what uh, has been detected by other authors, largely there's no evidence, according to Jody Hay, there's no evidence for intergressive hybridization between common chimps and bonobos. Okay? There are other authors that act, argue that there's a really strong signal when you look at whole genomes, but I won't argue that point. Here, though, you can see the various migration, according to Jody's terminology, or intergression events between Western into Eastern, Central into Western in particular. So those are the significant, he had a whole series of models that had more complexity of this than this, more intergression events. But these are the ones that were highly significant using his IM modeling, okay? And so those are explaining probably a good, in fact, he does argue this, explains a good bit of why we see this kind of interdigitation, okay? Uh, discordance with the taxonomic positioning of these individuals. Okay, any questions as I move forward? Okay. I don't know if I've told, shown you, have I shown you that photo? That's me. Um, yeah, I still have the same, yeah, developmental patterns. So, and before you ask, someone once said to me, I can't believe you were so uh, inconsiderate to show yourself holding a gun on a horse. That is not a gun. That's a telephone. Actually, it's a power pole in the back. But we did. All Texans ride horses. Okay, no, not really. But we did raise horses. I grew up, grew up out in the country. So that's why I put it in quotes, humans. Texans are not necessarily humans. Um, so what about us? So let's start with this. Now I have to ask you because I've been showing this. Have I shown you this? No? Nope. Okay, 1967. I think I've actually mentioned this before, but I'll repeat myself. This was something that shattered evolutionary pat paradigm that had been long standing, particularly in terms of evolutionary anthropology. Okay, this is a good example of why you should read older literature as well, especially, you know, that that's considered classic. This is a classic bit of data or results. And why is it? Okay, because Sarich and Wilson, 1967, using a molecular clock, using something called albumin immunological distance, which estimated based on the uh, similarity of albumin, not DNA, DNA hybridization, but albumin, estimated that we had diverged from chimpanzees and gorillas lineages somewhere around four to six million years ago maybe. Okay, we all know that, right? I mean, I assume if you've read any of the literature, you go, yeah, okay, we've known that forever. No, we've known it since 1967. Now, maybe for you guys that's forever, but I was 10, okay? So it's not really forever. So what was the big deal about this? Well, because paleoanthropologists, i.e. those looking at fossils, had told us that we knew because of the differences we could see and measure between us and Pan and Gorilla that the divergence was 30 to 40 million years old. Occurred 30 to 40 million years ago. This exploded paleoanthropology. Okay, and the reason is is because they then were able to go in and ask the question, oh, now we understand, we can test the hypothesis about all these fossils that we didn't, couldn't place anywhere. Now we understand that with an independent test, we aren't from back here with divergence, long divergence between us and gorilla, um, but rather up here. We're a very young species complex. But remember, the paradigm was we are so different that we, have, we belong in completely different taxonomic units. 
all of that work together, okay? Humans can't be in the same genus as these guys because we're humans. It's more of a philosophical, sociological comment, right, than it is a biological. And so this was a game changer for evolutionary biology and evolutionary uh, anthropology in particular. But these are the lineages we can start with, and I've shown you the data I'm about to show you again asking when we diverged from a common ancestor and as we diverged, did we come back together again and overlap and exchange genes? And the answer is yes. And I've, like I say, I've shown you this. This is this AIC uh, analysis from Malin et al. I think it's PLOS Genetics. I can send it to you if you want it. But remember, actually, when was it, yesterday morning that we, someone was talking about using this methodology for model testing. But anyway, any, any values in the model testing that they had here, the distribution above zero supports intergressive hybridization during divergence. Anything below zero suggests that it's allopatrically diverged. So in other words, the vast majority of the information fits a non-allopatric model. This is between us and the two different, co different species of pond, okay, bonobos and common chimpanzees. So those proto-lineages. And these could be auto-correlated, by the way, right? Because we, we could, these hybridization, integration events that are reflected in this easily could be, almost certainly are, mostly in the ancestor of those two forms. Right, because after about four million years, we have re post-zygotic reproductive isolation is predicted to be complete between mammal, mammal mammalian lineages. Okay. So this would have been two-thirds of the time we could have been hybridizing uh, with the other lineages, but not two million years, from two million years ago to the present, probably not. Okay, so... That's our analogy. So, so when I finished that section, I said, all right, in the, the book, and there were a lot of other examples, southeastern forms, southeast Asian forms of primates, Asian forms of primates. I have never found a primate group that doesn't have reports of reticulate evolution in it. Okay, so I use those as building up the story of analogy anyway, or the example of analogy like Darwin did to say, look, this is, this is a real phenomenon in primates. We're a primate. Our closest related primates appear to have intergressed with us, okay, as we diverge from those, those lineages from a progenitor. So what about us? And this is an unbelievable uh, understatement. And there are various reasons why this question has generated an enormous amount of controversy. It still is, okay? So, for example, we were asked to write a review paper um, for trends in ecology and evolution a couple of years ago. And it was a paleoanthropologist from South Africa, a colleague of mine, Becky Ackerman. There was another guy that, who I haven't met who's a cultural anthropologist from Australia, and then myself. And so we had fossils, culture, and genomics. And that's, they asked us if we could put this tree article together about uh, what is referred to in cultural anthropology, and I never even knew this, by the way, that's how ignorant I was of cultural anthropology, but it's called creolization. Creoles in Louisiana, for example, are these admixture of folks that are French, African-American, or African, uh, German, Irish, you know, all sorts of admixture there, really cool leads to really good food, by the way. And so uh, this creolization, they asked us to write about it and hybrid, hybridization, the evolution of humans. So we did it and we sent it in and it was torn apart by the reviewers. Some liked it, a couple of them liked it. But to give you an idea, they asked 28 people, I think it was, to review it. And they got two reviews. Because the field, I, you have to understand, this is a 
you know, that science is a sociological endeavor. It's a philosophical endeavor. Certain fields, maybe for historical contingency reasons, are really, really um, device, divisive and divided. And paleoanthropology and anthropology in general, it is amazing how they fuss and fight. So anyway, one of the things, I say that this has generated an enormous amount of controversy. One of the reviewers said, fine. I'm, I'm sure it was one of the, the way they wrote their review, I'm sure they were one of the ones who held on forever and said, we did not intergress with anything else. We wouldn't have done that. We're different species. So this person literally wrote, okay, we intergressed but not much got transferred and it doesn't mean anything. You know, it doesn't, it hasn't led to any kind of evolutionary novelty. They need to just go away and quit trying to write this review. I mean, it was scathing, absolutely scathing. So it's not just pre-2010. So what about our own species? Well, geographical and genetic components, one of the reasons that people, this is a panel out of that, that Reticulate evolution in humans, this figure that I drew up, just to indicate three different models, okay, of human evolution that have been proposed. One of the reasons this, this is so divisive is because a lot of human evolution studies were based around, uh, inherently based around racism, okay? Um, I'm sure you have these problems in India because we have them in every society but we sure had it here, okay? And what I mean by that is this multi-regional model was proposed by, surprise, surprise, a European-esque white guy who said, we know that Europeans are superior to everybody else. Given that, we know that Africans, Asians, and Australians could not have evolved directly from the same ancestor. So therefore, you see how this logistically, logically works out. We all must have evolved from Homo erectus, but we did it as individual lineages with a little bit of gene flow, but not a lot to contaminate those good white people. Okay, so this is called the candelabra or multi-regional model. So because of that, this whole freaking field has been contaminated not by racism by everybody, but trying to battle that, okay? Trying to battle back against this. So, it, so anytime you talk about local adaptations in our populations, people will often go back to this and say, you're trying to do Skinner's model. And we're like, no, not at all. So what's another model? Well, this is the one that held sway until, until 2010. So this one was replaced and shown to be based around just racist theology, if you will. But this one came about, uh, this replacement model was suggested in the past, but this was supported by Becky Kahn and Alan Wilson's data from the mitochondrial DNA survey of our species, which said that the root of our species, of Homo sapiens, fell securely in Africa. And they were testing alternative hypotheses. They weren't testing this, but what they were saying was, did we come, because there were alternative hypotheses at that time in the 1990s, still around from, because of fossil finds. Did our species arise in Africa? Did it arise in the Middle East? Did it arise in Asia? Those were all viable options based on fossil records, various fossils. So their mitochondrial DNA and then later the Y chromosome DNA securely anchored us as coming out of Africa and using a molecular clock analysis with the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, which dated it, coalesced a little bit earlier, but still within the realm of 50 to 100,000 years ago. But their replacement model stated that we came out, Homo sapiens came out, and these guys went extinct without any intergressive hybridization. 
This is the alternative to that. We come out at the same time. So you have Homo erectus coming out in waves and other species probably coming out of Africa at different points. But we don't come out until then. And then as we come out, we intergressively hybridize rather than just plainly replace. When I argued this in that book, for example, one of the reviewers who I cited in this new book at the start of this first chapter stated, Mike just needs to stop arguing this because we know from molecular data and everything else that we did not intergress with other species of homo. Okay? But this was the alternative. So are there other kinds of data that I was able to, that I could put together? All right, what is required for genetic exchange? At a minimum, spatial, o I know, you're like, yeah, duh. Uh, spatial and temporal overlap between the lineages involved. So the question is, the question I addressed in this book was, okay, other primates hybridize. Why, didn't, why wouldn't have we? So people would argue, well, we probably didn't even encounter, maybe we didn't even encounter one another which was a bit of a weak argument. But I had to try to figure out, did homo species overlap in space and time? And the answer is yes, but this figure, and I pointed out in the book, this figure needs to be qualified. There's a big caveat on this particular figure, but I'll show you some more data in a moment. So what I give here for Erectus heidelbergensis floresiensis, that's the hobbit, sapiens and neanderthalensis, are the dates from fossil record, okay, that those species have been around, okay? And then also, if they have an arrow between them, not only were they around at the same time, but they were around in the same place. However, the big caveat here is these data just indicate general regions, okay? So just because Neanderthalensis and Sapiens were in what we call Europe now, one of them may have been in France and the other one in Spain. You're not going to take a fast train and get together, right? They're not really overlapping, even though people said, you know, we overlapped with Neanderthalensis, time and space. Those data don't show it, but this at least starts us towards could we have overlapped with the various species? right, and intergressively hybridized with them. This gives us a, maybe a little bit of a clue. Okay, so let's look at Neanderthalensis and sapiens then. Remember we, once again, still we're in 2007, 2008. So specific sites though, not just general regions. So there's also a 2015 paper that talks about this site and others. So this is a particular specific cave site. And uh, I think it's in France, I always forget. Maybe it's in Spain. But anyway, this particular specific cave site, if you look at the dates up here, these are radiocarbon dates. And I boxed in the ones where you have overlap of sapiens and Neanderthalensis artifacts, quote unquote two different regions of time or two different time periods. So in other words, this would indicate that yes, we did overlap in time and space very likely, okay? It still doesn't indicate that we didn't beat one another to death and instead mate, but at least it indicated yes, we occupied the same site, okay? So this is where Becky Kahn and Alan Wilson's and all the paleoanthropologists, this was the game changer, right? These data were the game changer for the replacement model. The replacement model was falsified. Regardless of what people want to say, these were the first two studies, and now there have been a huge number of studies afterwards where the first one, these are both from Svante Pabo's group, okay, Max Planck group. The first one indicating, you, looking at the Neanderthal lensis genome and then the Denisovans genome, which is a, probably a distinct species. It's definitely distinct in terms of uh, genomically, et cetera, and where it occurred. 
Both of these papers detected intergressive hybridization between us and these two now extinct species. Okay. This was the nail in the coffin, once again, to the replacement model. Okay. However, once again, remember, and I'll show you some other things in a moment, but remember that this is still what we were presenting last year, asked to write this review, and people said, big deal, so what? It's you know, only a low percentage. If you are tempted to say that about your group, like, well, 96% of it is vertically transmitted. Number one, it's not, as I've mentioned this, because a good part of your genome, of bird genomes, of mammal genomes, are actually retro elements that have been horizontally transferred in or now being vertically transmitted, but they may make up about 40% of the genome. So vertical transmission is not the rule. Okay, just from ancient times onward in terms of vertebrates, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's not the rule. But also, let's say that it's only 4 to 6 percent. Remember, no genome, no genome, no genome, plants, animals, of eukaryotes, no genome has been totally assembled. It's only gene space. 20 some odd thousand genes have been assembled because the rest of it is repeated DNA that you cannot align. Now they're trying to put together methodologies, and that's actually real important because we're missing a lot of enhancers, regulatory sequences, and all sorts of stuff that are really important for our evolution and for bird evolution or whatever else. Now, we have it pared down to just genes, functional stuff. Four to six percent, multiply that times 20 some odd thousand and that gives you the number of genes that have intergressed. That's a crap load as I like to say of genes. Lots and lots and lots of functional elements have intergressed into us from these other species. It's non-trivial. The same thing can be said in hybrid zones and divergence with genetic exchange across eukaryotes. So when people argue in Nature articles, for example, it's all vertical transmission, largely, blah, 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 blah. Remember, they're doing the rarity argument. Oh, well, it's rare, so it's not important. Remember, hopefully, that'll click a switch in your mind that you go out and test or test with their data and say, well, what does that mean, rare? You know, 4 to 6 percent times 22,000 is a lot of genes in these birds, for example, okay? So keep that in mind that, that it's, it's a qualitative rather than a quantitative uh, estimate often that people are making. They quantify it. They say, well, 96% of it is not. 96% of the genes aren't. That's true. What if these are all adaptive? They're probably not, by the way. <laughs> I wouldn't argue that. All right, so I think I've shown you this. So this is the hypothesis that we started out with back in long time ago, two years ago, when this was reviewed by Barama and Hammer. So one of the things that's really cool is to remember that we were not the only homo species in Africa, right? Lots of, there was, there were very divergent lineages in our point of origin, just like a lot of baboons, a lot of, you know, a lot of different kinds of primates. And while we were there, we were admixing. Okay, that's what the genomics tell us. And then as we moved out, we had various events. And then even more current hypothesis is this. And I've shown you this as well. Oop, don't have the box around it. So, um, like I told you before, I believe, probably there's a more, more, more current, sort of like, you know, next, 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 next generation sequencing. So there's probably another one out there that I've missed now uh, because this was early 2016. But anyway, this is the kind of complexity we're seeing, right? So we have the kind of exchange events not only between the now extinct and us, various populations of us, 
But we also have evidence that we actually intergressed into these species. The prediction and also extinct into extinct. They weren't extinct at the time, obviously. Okay. Now, just as a little aside, I'm going to postulate, hypothesize, that there will be a directionality. There will be an asymmetry if we can get enough data. Maybe this is going to be the major flow direction of intergression. Remember this asymmetry of plants and animals. Um, this is what we've detected so far, but let me hasten to add that this could be artifact sampling. I don't mean that these aren't real intergression events, they are, but we don't have very many Neanderthalensis or Denisovan genomes. We have huge numbers of us resequenced. So our level of power for detecting intergression into us is orders of magnitude greater than it would be the other direction. So maybe Maybe as we move through, if we could get enough genomes of these guys, we'd see that the asymmetry is actually the other direction. I don't know. Okay, this may be real. I'm just throwing that out there that keep in mind the limitations of the data that have been sampled. Okay. Questions or comments? All right, here's the so what. So, and this is what we tried to point out to the reviewers. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, I've shown you these data before, but let's, let's think about this a little bit more deeply than I have before. So these are a series of loci, lots of loci down here, multiple, okay, Neanderthalensis and Indosapiens and Neanderthalensis and Indosapiens. These are a series or sets of loci and these are your adaptations, okay, that they affect, that they're known to affect from uh, comparative data of humans. So the take home then is that the low frequency of integration has had major influences on adaptation in our species. Okay? With various various characteristics. But I want to I want to focus on this. Um, because in the current, this is part of the table from the current uh, tree manuscript that we have that we've sent off, Krishna Kunte and I have put together. So this disease risk has been argued, there, it's been argued that a number of intergressed regions from Neanderthalensis into us, and we would, they would probably argue some of the Denisovans, are actually maladaptive. Their argument goes like this, their logic goes like this, these authors, is that the alleles they're looking at here, some of the alleles, not these, but other intergressed material, when they do association studies, those alleles are significantly, even if the R square is very low, they're significantly associated with things like type 2 diabetes or stomach cancer in Latin populations or whatever. So there's a whole cascade of them. And this was in a, this was a science paper. I think it was called like Neanderthal Legacy in Humans. And their point was that not only positively in terms of raising fitness occurred from integration, but negative fitness effects would have occurred as well. Okay. So we, we pointed to this and said, okay, look, there are some good examples of where intergression has been documented to affect survivorship or reproduction or et cetera. You can have maladaptive intergression. There's examples from various mammals. So we're not arguing with that. But I would argue all day long that most of the traits, in fact, all of them that I've seen them list, are not pre-reproductive. Okay, they're not innate immunity against diseases that would kill you before you reproduce. Secondly, they're also associated with diseases or pathologies in humans that almost to a one are due to lifestyle. 
like type 2 diabetes, which is strongly associated with activity patterns, you know, eating habits, et cetera, which were almost, no, they couldn't have been in our hunter-gatherer societies. We just wouldn't have been doing the same activities or inactivities if you're in the U.S., okay? So we, want, we, we presented this and said, look, and we actually had a good example of mal two good examples of maladaptive. One from Dolph Schluter's work with sticklebacks, it was maladaptive in the sense that it was ecosystem-wide. You had an integrative hybridization, and you had a collapse of the ecosystem. So we could say that that, that maladaptive was actually could be transmitted from the hybridization, the units that were hybridizing all the way through the ecosystem. So it's not that it can't be maladaptive. It obviously can be. But I just think that they got this paper into science under false pretenses. It's just a bad conclusion. It really is. They're not evolutionary biologists. That's the bottom line. The folks who publish this are not. They're medical folks. So I understand why they're saying it, and, but the disease risk is not just because we um, have a higher risk to disease because an allele was in there from somebody else like Dennis Sobins, once again, you have to ask, lower fitness and maladaption means that it has to affect fitness, right? So just keep that in mind. Just like these have to affect, to be adaptive, positively adaptive, they need to affect pre-reproduction and reproduction, right? They need to help you to survive to reproductive age. The diseases themselves or the genomic? So the, you mean we could have come out and transmitted diseases to Neanderthal? Absolutely. My, so this is complete speculation right now based on what we've seen in human populations when they come in contact. So let's take North America. So Europeans come in and we want to extirpate the native populations, my, my wife's ancestors. We want to get rid of them, okay? They're on our land, quote unquote. They're in our way. They're keeping us from developing. I mean, it was completely, it was genocide. So one of the ways that the Europeans did that was to intentionally try to spread disease, like smallpox, cholera. So they did not isolate the native populations from sick people. And the decimation there was unbelievable. It wasn't from bullets that the native populations were decimated. It was from disease. So I, and I think you can see that in, South, in the New World. And I suspect you would see that in the Old World too, but I don't know. Those data I'm not sure. I know the histories of the New World much better than I do the Old World. Now, because of that, I wonder and I would hypothesize that as we came out, the extinction of Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, et cetera, could have been due to demographics, i.e. we were more numerous and we were carrying diseases that they had no innate immunity for. I don't know. So, um, yeah. So it wouldn't have anything to do with us intergressively hybridizing with them, per se, but rather, we just spread disease. I, I don't, once again, I have no idea. It's like trying to figure out why all of the major megafauna, or the megafauna in North America went extinct. They're still arguing about that. Originally, or initially, it was we killed them all as we came. Now that, see, it's lovely, has nothing to do with Europeans. I like that part. It had to be my wife's ancestors that killed them all. But that doesn't, that model, all kidding aside, that model doesn't hold together. So now, so much, uh, potentially. So now there's a model of there was a smaller asteroid strike in North America around that time. Meteor, very large meteor, 
So maybe it changed the climate. There's alternatives. So anyway, I don't know if disease has wiped out Neanderthalensis and the other species, but it just seems awfully coincidental. And I cannot believe that we, through war, killed them all through combat, but I don't know. Other questions? Yes. So, uh, let's say you can use the There are there are parts of pathways, but without, for example, without that, it uh, we don't live on the Tibetan plateau. So, and the innate immunity, and there's. So the, yeah, these are real complex, usually complex cascades, but some of them, or all of them, trigger certain responses. So like, uh, with the hypoxia pathway, you know that it is in a certain area, so is it like that for all of these? There is definite, yes. So uh, for example, skin and hair characteristics, response to UV, these are closely associated, okay? So, um, let's see. Hang on just a second. Come on. No. So I don't have that figure. Um, the answer is yes, there are geographical components. So look at me. I've uh, been out in the sun a little bit, so I'm a little bit brownish for me and then look at your coloration. So there's a clinal variation, right? And there are pockets of different skin colors and also different hair types. And those are reflective of response to UV, okay? And susceptibility to certain things that would kill us potentially when we were children. Heat prostration, all sorts of prostration, all sorts of things like that. So the differences there are largely due to intergressive, no, the differences are correlated to different alleles being intergressed at different places from different organisms. And so, um, but it's, these are complex traits, right? You're not going to find, you're never going to find an NIH in the U.S., they used to have guys come out in lab coats and say, this was 20 years ago, fortunately they quit doing this. Medical researchers come out and be interviewed on camera on CNN or whatever saying, we found the breast cancer gene. Well, there is no such thing as a breast cancer gene. It's a quantitative trait. There are genes that contribute a lot to it, right? There are genetic elements. So once again, these, these Loci, well, that, they don't even know what the adaptation is. It's just got a very strong signature of, of um, a selective sweep, incredibly strong signature. But even it is only in a portion of our geographic range, right, which is exactly what you would expect for local adaptations. It's, this one is sort of easier to understand, I guess, because it's at high elevations. Um, Following on from that, to answer your question, so Denisovan integration and high elevation adaptation in humans, I had those couple of references were down at the bottom. So um, the first analyses of the hypoxia or the first detection of the hypoxia gene or allele integration into us was detected in Tibetans, right, living on the plateau. So when we were trekking last year, in the, in the Himalayas going up to around 5,000 meters, you know, we were passing, Francis and I were passing villages, established villages that were, say, three to 4,000 meters, all the way up to Annapurna Base Camp, which actually they retreat from in the wintertime, but only down to, say, 3,500 meters or so. So my question, because I already knew about the hypoxia alleles, I was wondering where these guys, if they might, the, the folks that were living in this Himalaya region, maybe they had the alleles from Denisovans. And so, and so this year, very recently, this came out, which is, if you can see here, low altitude is the darker green, okay, down in here. 
And then it's sort of hard to see, but two to 3,000 meters is this lighter, okay? And then high altitude over 3,000 meters is blue. And if you, you just run your eyes across it, and you can see that from two to 3,000 meters is where you have the, the Denisovan, it's called the core Denisovan haplotype. It just has to do with the SNPs that identify this hypoxia allele, hypoxia affecting, response affecting allele uh, that's from Denisovans. That's what they mean by core haplotype. But so those, it answered a number of different questions. Number one, that in that region, it does look like it's affirmation or support for that idea that it's adaptive at high elevations, like it was suggested for Tibetans. But also, it also indicates that these guys, they didn't know where the populations in the Himalayas actually came from. There were suggestions from the west maybe from the south, from India, but this would indicate that the migration patterns would actually come from East Asia into the Himalayas. So that was another thing that they were testing for, or sort of a phylogeographic analysis of our, of our species in this area. But keep in mind that on a microgeographic, this is to address your question uh, in a little more detail, the pattern of integration here is right up against no integration here. So, so local adaptations in plants and animals, ignore genetic exchange for a moment, we've always theorized that local adaptations can be very, very localized. And reciprocal transplant experiments with plants often would take plants literally from here one meter away from here, trade them, and then they would find differences, that it affected those plants. And so it can be on a real micro level. Then if you throw in this idea of integration being adaptive at, at some loci, then you expect local adaptation to be local. Now this is across a big region, Tibetan Plateau, Himalayas, but it's still local, right? relative to, it's, it's pretty circumscribed relative to our species, uh, species distribution, I should say. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yeah, it's a good question. The, um, so the question is, why do we call them different? Let's just back up for a moment. Why do we call Denisovans, uh, for example, I think they'll end up naming them, and Neanderthalensis, so Homo Neanderthalensis and Homo whatever that's going to end up being. Why do we call them different species and Heidelbergensis, et cetera? If this is to scale, so if you look at the level of divergence between us and the time of divergence, say we diverged 1.8 million years ago from ish or whatever, 600,000 years ago, however long ago, there's been sufficient time for us to be different species. People argue from the fossil record to begin with, now we have genomics for these, but from the fossil record, they're using fossil characteristics and they're using, we're this different, and so therefore, we're different species. But there's a fallacy in that. It's, it's barcoding, right? Because what they were actually saying there was a biological species concept. They were saying Neanderthalensis is this different from us, from Homo sapiens, therefore they would not have interbred. One of the major resistances to us, 
to the suggestion that we introgressed with Neanderthalensis was the fact that people argued that if we did, Neanderthalensis should be a subspecies, or we should be a subspecies of Neanderthalensis. I don't know which name has priority. And people were very resistant to that. They said, no, 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 it's too divergent, you know, it's different species. So they're doing it on the basis of morphological typology in the fossil, from the fossil record. Um, what I can tell you is, once again, to me, it doesn't matter. Because remember the effects that these integration events have occurred. OK, I, I don't really care if we're subspecies or not. We're definitely divergent to a certain degree from Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. And indeed, the hybridization, the admixture of those uh, standing genetic variation between the two forms has led to adaptive evolution in us. And probably it might have if they could have stayed around, maybe even in them. So now they have genomic information to suggest separate clade for Denisovans and Neanderthal lenses and divergent enough, quote unquote, to be considered different species. However, we're sister complex, sister species, maybe not direct sister species, maybe we're closer to Hylobrigensis or something like that, some other species, but this clade is definitely intergressed with us. So looks like, once again, it looks all the different species of dogs and things like that. So that's why, though, why they named them different species originally, all based on morphological traits. So it's, you know, it's morpho species. Yeah, so it's changing all the time. Okay, so originally, remember, I don't know, you know, so if you wanted to insult somebody, you can still do it in the States. You call them a Neanderthal. What do we mean by that? And generally, it's, it's towards a guy <laughs> uh, who's been a misogynist. You know, is, you, generally, we use the term Neanderthal towards a guy because he thinks women should be barefoot and pregnant is how we put it. So why would we call somebody a Neanderthal when we want to use it as a negative term? Well, it comes from cultural anthropologists arguing and physical anthropologists arguing that Neanderthal lensis individuals were retrograde to sapiens. No cultural aspects, definitely no religious aspects, no burial price, you know, you name it. They just didn't have a societal uh, they didn't have a societal component. They were just roving bands, as opposed to us. And I, we were derived, and so we had all of these things as we came out of Africa. Well, the more that they've studied Neanderthalensis, they know now that they, had, uh, they have detected uh, complex burial practices that reflect something akin to religion, you know, kinds of practices of how they bury their dead, uh, tool usage that's similar but different from sapiens. And so I'm saying this because it's evolving. This is what I learned when I wrote this with this cultural anthropologist uh, from Australia. I learned what they knew and what they didn't know. And one of the things that they're discovering is that they're reanalyzing the information they had in this new paradigm, which is Neanderthalensis was a, you know, was basically a human. Okay, it was a different species, but it was as derived in traits as we were. And as we moved out and were intergressed, we actually locally adapted due to intergression with this, i.e. they were more adapted to certain environments, were adapted to environments we could not invade without that intergression. So it's changing. You know, I, it's not a real clear picture yet, but Mm -hmm. The question that I'm trying to get at is it seems very, uh, so following up 
example the previous question is if we say this is if we imagine that all of these lineages got extinct um so i mean that's quite a few homo lineages right tons so yeah the, the only possible explanation to what what you said is is only after the contact with the homo sapiens that uh, one of the species could have given rise to the extinction it all of them going yeah. extinct by natural causes seems very unlikely considering how evolved uh, they were in terms of Yeah. Um if you yeah, if you compare that yeah, that that and erectus for example. And that erectus may be a little bit too recent, but that was based on reports and a science. But say this is more like 40. We know that those times are really overlapping closely when we came in. This is not. 195,000 years ago probably is a little too early uh, for us to um, have caused its demise. But it's awfully coincidental. And by the way, the coincidental nature of this has always been used as an idea that, well, we know we were placed without mating, so we must have outcompeted them or had conflicts with them somehow to lead to their extinction. So it's always been sort of agreed on that we were the cause of their extinction, likely, some way. Um, I, I just wonder if it's not through diseases. Since we know we intergressed with them, we did not always kill them outright. <laughs> we obviously made it. One other thing I should mention to you, too, you were asking about, let me get back here, you were asking about um, evidence why they considered them different species. The other part of this um, is that now that they've looked in detail at these genomes and our genomes, there are signatures Okay, in animals, I may have mentioned this before, but in animal systems or in plants that have uh, sex chromosomes, in eukaryotes with sex chromosomes, divergent lineages that, that mate with one another often show what's called Haldane's rule, which is in the F1 hybrid, the heterogametic sex is sterile or highly infertile. I, in our case, Neanderthalensis times sapiens would have been the male F1s. There is, there is evidence from the genomic signature of what got transmitted and where and when to suggest that, that those F1 hybrids may have actually demonstrated Haldane's rule, which would also suggest a measure of reproductive isolation. Obviously, there's reproductive isolation because when you look across the genome, certain regions were not intergressed. So our genome is a mosaic of, well, a lot of things, but it's a mosaic of these sequences. So it's not uniformly distributed across the whole genome, or whole gene space, I should say. So that also leads to the suggestion that we did indeed probably have reproductive barriers, post-zygotic reproductive barriers between us and Neanderthalensis and Denisovans. Okay. Other questions or comments? All right. Um, let's skip over this. I showed you that already. Showed you that. And now I'm going to show you my family. So um, this is my family. You've seen, most of you have seen Francis. Weird coloration on that, okay? So you can't really see it. Basically, I'm the only non-Asian there, okay, really. Francis is Asian by descent. Uh, a large proportion of her genome would have come from East Asia-ish because she is uh, First Nation, or Native Americans, or American Indians, whatever you want to call her, Cherokee and Choctaw. These are our two little F1s who don't like being called F1s. I don't know why. 
and this is me as the white honky dude, and this is our daughter-in-law, Amber, who is Asian, okay? So, I uh, may have mentioned to you, but if I haven't, I will tell you, that I want to give us our genomes for Christmas, okay? We celebrate Christmas. My family is incredibly unenthused about this. They don't want that to be their Christmas present, and I told them, so what would we expect so what I, I don't really care if I'm Irish, French, and German. I want to know how much Neanderthalensis and how much Denisovan, and once they sequence it, how much Heidelbergensis and how much whatever else I am, and what adaptations I may have or not that Francis and Brian and Jenny, our two kids, and Amber have. Okay? What kind of allelic variation do we have from now extinct species, and what does that reflect about our ancestry? So, um, so what we would expect, based only based right now, let's see, no, only based on what we now know from Neanderthalensis and Denisovan genomes. So this is only going to get more complex, okay? What we would expect, given that I'm European-esque, okay, is that I would have Neanderthalensis, the expectation is I have Neanderthalensis integration, but not really Denisovans. Whereas Francis, Brian, and well, Francis and Amber, I should say, will have both at a much higher frequency than I do. Okay, particularly the Denisovan. Our little F1s will have admixture between me and Francis, where they will have her Denisovans at a certain proportion and Neanderthalensis plus my Neanderthalensis. And if our alleles differ, they'll be more Neanderthalensis than either one of us, right, just by additive. And then Amber will also, like Francis, have an enormous amount, compared to me, of Denisovan ancestry, okay, significantly higher than I will have. Now, all of this reflects, once again, differences would, we would expect I want to do this as a little bioinformatics experiment with some undergrads. Get our genomes and just set them out and say, you don't need to know who this is. Just do the bioinformatics and tell me what's there. So that's the kind of little microcosm. I know it's a cutesy thing, but it's, it's that kind of diversity is what we see in our species. So from very broadly different geographic regions. Amber is from Asia, okay? I am not. Francis is sort of from Asia with an admixture event from Europeans, et cetera. So that's the kind of complexity, the mosaic genomes that we possess. We are a hybrid. Okay, so what have we learned? Uh, our species has a genome, which is a mosaic of various archaic homogene sequences and protochimps as well. And a portion of this variation from genetic exchange uh, is demonstrably adaptive. A portion of it may also be, and we would hypothesize, and we do in this tree manuscript that's under review right now, we do indeed hypothesize because it was relatively recent in terms of numbers of generations ago that we hybridized with Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and probably a number of other species that we may be carrying around maladaptive pieces of DNA. We don't think it's been identified yet by the traits that have been presented thus far, but it's not um, impossible. In fact, I would say it's likely that there are a few traits in us that actually really were maladaptive, somehow got through, maybe through genetic drift, bottlenecks, whatever it happens to be. Okay. So in general then, and this is sort of wraps up this course from me, it, it really does, in the final analysis, this is a much better metaphor and it's becoming much and much too simple. I've mentioned this. Doolittle's metaphor of the of a whatever that is, I've forgotten what he called it, but what I call a web of life, is defined, is defining the domains of life and their evolution. But keep in mind that we're never arguing that there's no tree-like aspects, divergent branch-like aspects 
right during evolution. This even has that kind of divergence and diversification. And they're, they're interrelated. I would argue that they're interrelated by vertical and horizontal transfers. Both of these metaphors and both of these, yeah, they're metaphors, okay? This was not observation per se. It's based on what Darwin thought. These are more observation based, but still it's a metaphor for how we think about evolutionary change. Okay. That's it for me. So questions before we break for lunch? Questions, comments before we break for lunch? Yeah. Um, in, in one sense, it's very easy, I think, to draw that line, right? You have biogeography tells us where things exist, where certain species exist, uh, where English sparrows ought to be, and yet we bring them across the U.S., okay? Where rabbits should be, not in Australia where cane toads should be, South America, not in Australia, you know. But that's after because we, we know for a fact that it's the had bad consequences. But there could have been instances where an introduction has led to something, you know, positive or good. Like in the case of the, the mountain lion example that you showed us. Right. Those are, yes, you're exactly right. Could have. But except in a few cases where we actually had management practices for conservation where we were doing genetic rescue, I can't think of an example where the transfer, accidental or otherwise, of species between different places has not led to negative impacts on the ecology, the ecological ecosystem of wherever they were dropped in. I can't think of a single one. So, so I, for me, it's real easy. Stop moving stuff around, you know? We shouldn't have ever done it in the first place. You know why they moved English sparrows is because the Brits were homesick. It's like, couldn't you have found something else that was nicer than a stupid sparrow? But they brought them across intentionally. That's generally what we do. They brought the rabbits to Australia to hunt. And so, I, you know, they put kudzu into the U.S. No, but I, I understand. How do we draw that line? Well, I think, I think there will be instances where we can use genetic rescue, but all of those other things that we talk about, invasive species, et cetera, we're not, generally we're not, yeah, they weren't done for genetic rescue. They were done to try to modify, like kudzu was introduced to try to stabilize the soil. Well, it did a good job of that. And it also stabilized the whole fringe of our forests in the southeast, killed off the trees. So, I don't know. So I don't, I, I can't think of an example. I've actually racked my brain over this. I can't think of an example where we move something to try to help that it didn't turn out to be, have negative effects. But maybe, maybe you can, I don't know. Because, you know, it's only going to lead to, you know, more green fish 
pitching, whatever. Yes. Like, yes. I mean, he's not he's not worried about whether it affects another species or not. Yes. I, absolutely, I'm biased. Yes. I'm absolutely biased towards uh, us not intentionally perturbing environments, however we're doing that, or unintentionally, accidentally perturbing them. And it is, I am biased because I read a lot about invasive species and I think about that and how that interacts with genetic exchange potentially and all this. And I lived in Australia for six years. I see dire consequences on the ecosystems of various introductions and so on. You know, and I'm in the southeast U.S. where we have nutria that got released, all sorts of different things. And so, yeah, I'm definitely biased. Uh, as opposed to someone in Georgia, for example, ignore the trout, they're constantly doing this introduction of various kinds of bass so that they have different species or bigger fish to catch in our lakes. But they're devastating various fish and then also other faunal aspects. So, but you're right. You're right. You're exactly right. And many people would argue, many non-science folks would argue, you know, I'm very naive because of that. That I need to understand that introducing those rainbows has millions of dollars worth of value to have them there on the west slopes because of fishing licenses and gear that people buy and stuff like that. And they wouldn't be there doing that unless those fish were there. So I, d I do understand there's a naivete at some level. Or, uh, yeah, no, it's not naivete because I understand that. But rather just I value, I add value to something non-monetary. You're talking about for domestication? Yeah. Domestication yeah. Exactly. And so, so we could, and, and indeed we can, the history of agriculture is one of, obviously, and domestication is one of directional selection for whatever traits, you know, non-shattering. I mean, things that are not in nature. Uh, so... Yes, and also agriculture is an enormous disturbance, okay? Raising cattle devastates certain areas in South America because they, you know, they mow down areas so that they can have fields. So I understand that, yeah. I mean, it has implications, but I, I yeah. I would argue that it's different if we're trying to provide food. I, I put an inherent value on people, and so, but I, for sport, or for just introducing to try to help something ecologically, it always backfires on us. Nutria were introduced into Louisiana originally to control the water hyson. Now they're a scourge. So, or if you don't know what they are, they look like a huge muskrat, sort of like a beaver kind of thing. But anyway, yeah, I understand, and there's a lot of issues. We didn't really talk about genetic modification at all, the more recent genetic modification, not the, for thousands of years, we've been genetically modifying crops and animals, but the recent genetic modification um, issues because that is genetic exchange, right? I mean, it's human-mediated transfer of genes. And it's a big issue. OK, other questions? Anything else? It's one. OK, well, you're released from me. Congratulations. There you go.